Gloucester, Massachusetts is America's oldest seaport. For most of its 400 year history, Gloucester was the fishing capital of the world. Its lifeblood is dangerous and costly. More than 10,000 people have left this port and lost their lives in the Atlantic. When disaster strikes, few live to tell the tale. But one fisherman's story of survival at sea surpasses all others, and his ambition and daring made him a legend in Gloucester and one of the most celebrated seafarers in history. I'm Corey Kukuru for 1623 Studios, and this is the story of Howard Blackburn. After triumphantly returning from his second crossing of the Atlantic, Howard Blackburn enjoyed a short celebration in Gloucester, then went back to New York Harbor with wife Teresa to retrieve the Great Republic as it arrived by steamship. In the fall of 1901, they attended the prestigious America's Cup race, as seen in these motion pictures captured by Thomas Edison. Dazzled by the expertly run and highly publicized event, Howard concocted another ambitious return to sailing. As he and Teresa cruised Great Republic back to Cape Ann, Blackburn mapped a two-year sailing odyssey through the Hudson River, to the Erie Canal, to the Great Lakes, to the Illinois River, down the Mississippi River, across the Gulf of Mexico to Key West, then to Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, then down to Panama and South America before coming home. Friends and family thought he was nuts, but Howard could never be swayed. However, this excursion would be the stuff of a Mark Twain story, filled with interesting characters, insight into America's heartland still recovering from civil war, rural river living, and a numerous stutters and stops. In the spring of 1902, Howard once again trolled through Gloucester's inner harbor to a big send-off. Lousy weather hampered the first leg to Brooklyn, but Blackburn wasn't in a hurry. He left plenty of room to take his time and revel with friends along the way. At that time, canals and locks were neglected, ever-changing, and oft times impossible to navigate. The rise in population and industry physically changed the courses of America's waterways. Water flow was largely untamed, Sandbars were unseen hazards at every bend, and watercraft traffic for business and pleasure exploded. By the time the latest nautical chart was printed, it was obsolete. Howard, fighting rheumatism through clenched teeth, routinely had the Great Republic towed by larger boats or pulled along riverbanks by pedestrians or mules. Sometimes he left the boat in the hands of others, who invariably bumbled and got the vessel in trouble, only to be rescued by the fingerless navigator. Freshwater travel proved just as perilous as the salty North Atlantic. Trying to cross Lake Erie through Canadian gales and busy steamship routes was more difficult for Howard than his dicey sail to Portugal. Steamer captains had much more visible competition within the confines of a lake, with orders to sink anything in their path. Celebrity couldn't get in the way of commerce. There were no friendly captains going out of their way to check Howard's condition and offer kerosene and coconuts. Nevertheless, cities were ecstatic to see the man and vessel who heroically crossed the Atlantic. Blackburn loved the congratulatory diversions and the whiskey and cigars that went with them. After a warm reception in Chicago, Howard was joined by a hitchhiker heading to New Orleans. The company was welcome, but the two dealt with nonstop trouble once they hit the Mississippi. Biblical thunderstorms, withering Midwestern humidity, and mosquitoes. They often ran aground on sandbars, forcing them to camp on shore. Howard had more than one bout of malaria and was sickened for weeks on end from drinking untreated river water. It got worse. Long stretches of the Mississippi had no retaining walls or rip wrapping along its banks to withstand erosion. Swaths of trees and cornfields often slunk into the river, putting the Great Republic in constant danger. It didn't take long, Columbus, Kentucky to be exact, 
for Howard's passenger to abandon ship for the comforts of a railroad boxcar. The river was so shallow, nothing more than a mud puddle really, that Blackburn had the Great Republic hauled by rail to Mobile, Alabama. Discouraged, in a message to Teresa, he promised to sell the boat and go home, but eventually changed his mind. There were friendly encounters too. A moonshiner who sampled Howard's tavern whiskey for a night, then refilled the supply with his own product as Howard slept. An Indian who traded his punt for the Great Republic's spare anchor. And on more than one occasion, a mariner Blackburn either met or worked with out of Gloucester. Then there was an agent for a traveling carnival who suggested that he and Howard partner up to tour the South with the Great Republic. They would dazzle paying audiences. Fathers bring your sons, mothers bring your daughters. Come see the fingerless man who braved the Atlantic in nothing more than this wooden raft. Think of the thousands who had already greeted him as he traveled, the Kearney told him. Senators, newspapermen, they were sitting on a gold mine. Howard liked the thought of a gold mine. He pocketed the man's business card. There was an odd proposition in Mobile. Two men asked Howard to sail them to the nearby ghost town of St. Joseph's Bay in Florida to secretly hunt for treasure with their can't miss divining rod. The three would split the profits evenly. Ever the opportunist, Howard agreed. Along the panhandle, people warned that St. Joseph's Bay was haunted. Yellow fever decimated the once prosperous timber port. Legend had it that the stricken families buried their savings before dying because the remote village had no bank. When Howard and the treasure hunters arrived, the cemetery was already ransacked, and the divining rod didn't turn up anything. Frustrated with his lack of mobility and weakened by malaria, Howard continued on his own. His tempo slowed. Blackburn spent a week in Tampa, another in Key West. The Great Republic couldn't negotiate Florida's shallow mud banks and swamps. While aground near Miami, Howard visited John and Laura Strong, summer residents of Gloucester, and sold the boat to them. The Strongs gifted him a 12-foot rowboat. Howard used leather straps to affix his hands to the oars and began rowing for Jacksonville, 400 miles away. Locals warned Howard of impassable waterways and predatory alligators. There were more lonely nights camping in mucky oyster beds, staving off Howard's worst fear snakes. Blackburn fell ill again near Cape Canaveral, barely halfway to Jacksonville, and couldn't go on. After nine arduous months, he sold the rowboat for four dollars and took a steamship home. It was February 1903, exactly 20 years since the Bergio disaster, and Gloucester was enduring an awful winter. The harbor froze, and a coal miner strike left the city without fuel. Howard had groceries delivered to needy families and donated thousands of dollars to Addison Gilbert Hospital. Friends were relieved that he was finally on the mend, but Howard immediately started work on another dory that was sturdy enough to cross the Atlantic, yet light enough to be carried by a small number of men, such as traveling carnival workers. Rumors of another voyage circulated. Copycats rushed to sail the Atlantic in vessels smaller than Howard's, some for the goal, some for the glory. It wasn't long before Blackburn revealed his wild intention to sail to France within 50 days, traverse the Mediterranean, sail back west to Puerto Rico and Cuba, through the Gulf of Mexico to New Orleans, then up the Mississippi to St. Louis, where mobs of people planned to celebrate the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase at the 1904 World's Fair, and presumably, an heroic seafarer and a 17-foot dory, fittingly named America. Howard left Gloucester in early June. All folks could do was shake their heads. It was the stormiest summer in 30 years. Howard and the America took a beating. As he inched towards Sable Island off the Nova Scotia coast, overpowering gales shoved Blackburn westward into the Bay of Fundy. Hundreds of schooners and dory fishermen scrambled for safe harbor. After 15 days without being seen or heard from, one schooner reported that Howard appeared fine despite the setbacks. He wasn't. Another storm capsized the America. 
As the vessel rolled, the water pressure trapped Howard inside the cabin. Blackburn thought he was a goner. Miraculously, the dory turned upright, but all the navigational equipment was either lost or broken. The provisions were spoiled. Without a compass or lantern, Howard headed for land. America lurched into Clark's Harbor, not far from where Howard grew up in Port Medway. Townsfolk and fishermen recognized their hometown hero and rushed to the dock to assist him. Howard was so arthritic, he nearly collapsed. It only took a few days of recovery, though, before he started refitting the boat to continue, against the protestations of friends and even his niece, Clark's Harbor's schoolteacher. He was given a compass, Bible, rations, and a tow to a safe launching area. The hardships continued. Sick and swollen, Howard veered far off course after discovering his compass was faulty. He was able to get America to Cape Canso at the eastern tip of Nova Scotia, where he made one last attempt for Europe. However, Howard was only a few days out when another bad storm tossed him overboard. He was able to climb on board, but his provisions were ruined and extra clothes washed away. He backtracked and bailed for three days towards Lewisburg and Cape Breton. Folks wanted to see the mythical Blackburn and the dory that survived the storms that kept the fishing fleet home. He was brought to the newspaper office to announce the end of his attempt. He relaxed for a bit and visited the innovative commercial cable company where he received a transatlantic telegraph message from Ireland, wishing him better luck next time. Howard spent a few days in Halifax to showcase America at the Nova Scotia exhibition. Afterwards, he sold the spunky dory for a cool $100 and took the railroad home. His daredevil days behind him, Blackburn spent his later years managing the bar and reconnecting with family. He enjoyed smaller excursions in his latest boat, Christopher Columbus, fishing for fun, collecting seashells, and sailing friends along the coast. Blackburn Tavern flourished, even throughout Prohibition when Howard was only allowed to sell near beer. But Gloucester was notorious for bootlegging and rum running. Cape Ann was an ideal area to transport alcohol. Countless inlets, watercraft with false bottoms, and waterfront businesses easily disguised illegal operations. Howard was frequently in court, thanks to an unannounced visit from federal agents, but with his name and political connections, never got more than a slap on the wrist. Howard's obsession with the sea never wavered. Just before turning 70, Blackburn had another sloop built, Cruising Club, to putt around Cape Ann. He openly dreamt of sailing the Mediterranean, but his wife and doctor talked him out of it. Not long thereafter, Teresa passed away. In failing health and nearly crippled, Howard spent most of his time confined to his apartment above the tavern, being looked after by a niece and the neighborhood. He tried anything to alleviate the pain in his legs, an experimental knee operation, having all of his teeth pulled upon a friend's recommendation and using a special bed frame that kept his heels higher than his heart. At the same time, the nation spiraled into the Great Depression, but Howard never stopped repaying Gloucester for making him feel whole after the disaster at Bergio. Through donations, he urged the Fisherman's Institute to create an unemployment relief fund. Between handouts and handshakes, it's said that he gave away up to $50,000. Howard Blackburn died on November 4, 1932, at the age of 73. Flags across harbors and homes flew at half-mast. The funeral procession down Gloucester's Main Street included hundreds of fishermen, mariners, coast guardsmen, and dignitaries. Pallbearers included Charles Adams, America's most famous yachtsman, Congressman A. Pyatt Andrew, for whom the arching bridge leading to Gloucester is named, inventor John Hayes Hammond, who often entertained Howard at his Hammond Castle laboratory, sculptor Leonard Kraske, who built the Gloucester Fisherman's Memorial statue, medical missionary Sir Wilfred Greenfell, who worked the impoverished coasts of Newfoundland and Labrador, Arctic explorers Bob Bartlett and Donald McMillan, and fishing industry titans Tom Gordon and Tom Carroll of what is now known as Gordons of Gloucester. 
At his request, Howard was buried at the Fisherman's Rest section of Beechbrook Cemetery in West Gloucester. Amongst hundreds of short, squat headstones, Howard's is easy to find. A small Nova Scotian flag stands beside it, and atop the granite marker lies a smattering of coins, left perhaps by admirers simply paying their respects, or fellow mariners who share a love for the sea, or maybe as an homage to the thousands of pennies Howard collected from tavern patrons each year to give to Addison Gilbert Hospital. Today, Blackburn's legacy carries on throughout Gloucester and its working waterfront. Cape Ann Museum, home to the majority of images in our story, has a permanent exhibit dedicated to showcasing Blackburn and the Great Republic. The vessel was tracked down and purchased by author Joe Garland, quite a sailor himself, who gifted the boat to the museum. Also featured is Alfred Johnson's Centennial, the man and vessel who inspired Howard to cross the Atlantic solo. The museum's library and archives houses volumes of notes from Howard's journeys, court cases, and news clippings, as well as the original manuscript of and correspondence regarding Lone Voyager, Joe Garland's epic retelling of Howard's life. The reference desk where one can request these materials is part of the original mahogany bar from the Blackburn Tavern. Speaking of the tavern, it still stands at the east end of Main Street and has been home to many iterations of the bar and eatery Howard established in the late 19th century. And every year, rowers and paddlers from around the world honor Howard's incredible tale of survival by partaking in the Blackburn Challenge, a 20 plus mile open ocean circumnavigation around Cape Ann. All to honor the unbreakable spirit of Gloucester's most legendary fisherman, Howard Blackburn. Thank you.